uh, Donna Hall is with us from Robinson, and uh, she recently moved down here. The, this is Virginia's daughter, Virginia Folk's daughter from, uh, daughter-in-law from uh, Robinson, but moved down from Auburn, Illinois just recently, back a few months ago. We're glad to have Donna with us here today. Amy and Blake Gardewine, where are you? There you are. Is Blake up here with you? Oh, he's asleep in the pew, right? Okay. I think he's a first-timer today, right? And that's why I wanted to recognize him. And also Gertrude Silger is here with us, visiting from Centralia, Illinois. We're glad to have you, Centra uh, from Gertrude, from Centralia, and any other visitors that might be here with us this morning. Also at this time, we're going to dismiss our uh, kids down to Junior Church. We'll do that at this particular time before Ed comes to speak to us. I got your water under the pulpit here, Ed. I didn't want to knock it off here, so I want you to know where your fuel's at here, okay? Okay, Ed will come share with us 454 is our hymn of decision this morning. 454. I'm glad that he's protecting my interests because we need that to get through the sermon. Someone asked me the other day if I was having trouble with my throat. The answer is no. It's in the best shape it's been in for years. I had surgery about a year and four months ago, and uh, this is the level that it came out at. And uh, while that might try you once in a while, it feels good to me because it was always getting worse before. And so it feels real good. I appreciated the message in song, or in music, actually wasn't song, with the flutes, were you there when they crucified my Lord? The answer to that is very simply no. Not in physical presence, we were not there. But if we will study the events that took place in the time corresponding with this time of the year, back when Jesus was here on the face of the earth, then maybe we'll understand what these couple of weeks are all about. Truth of the matter is, this couple of weeks is all about forgiveness. And that's what I want to preach about this morning. This matter of forgiveness. We've been dealing with the mission of the church for the last couple of nights and will again tonight. But the mission of the church is learn to forgive. To forgive people. That's why Jesus came and died was in order that forgiveness might take place. And as I said earlier, we can't possibly cover all of the various aspects of the mission of the church, but one of those aspects is that we learn to forgive. Several scriptures in the Bible just jump out at me and bother me once in a while. And one that I've had some, some problem with for a number of years, and, and I'm not sure I fully understand all of the aspects of it yet, but it, it bothers me once in a while and kind of keeps me thinking a little bit is in Romans 8, 1, where it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now the reason that bothers me occasionally is because I quite frequently find myself wanting to condemn some of those people for the things that they do. And yet Paul said, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so I'm glad that that scripture's there. Because it keeps bugging me and bothering me to the extent that maybe I will be a little bit careful about my desire to condemn people and, and, you know, to kind of get on them for their particular lifestyle or the things that they do. This thing of forgiveness is a major thing that we have not dealt well with in the church. And we simply have to begin to do a better job on this particular subject. I find that the forgiving of one another is probably the most difficult thing that Christians have to do. If there is an area of our Christian life 
Where we fail more than others, this might be it. We might be doing all right in our prayer time, in our Bible devotion, in our study, in our church attendance, in our inviting people to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. But every once in a while, this thing of a lack of forgiveness rears its ugly head and puts a stop to the power of all of those other things that we're trying to do. When I began to look at this subject of forgiveness to the extent that I wanted to present it to people like you, I began to try to break it down so that we could understand it and take something home. The first thing I wanted to know <coughs> was what can I expect from God and the Lord Jesus Christ in this matter? In other words, in relationship with them, when I do something that's wrong, what will God do for me when it comes to this matter of forgiveness? So I began to look for those scriptures that would give me some assistance there. I found Second Chronicles, the seventh chapter. There's a statement there in the 14th verse that says, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Way back in the Old Testament, when the prophets were talking about God, God was already saying, as long as we were willing to turn from our wicked ways and, and turn toward Him, He would hear us from heaven and He would forgive our sin. That's important to me. It's important to me because I'm a sinner and because I have sinned and because I probably will sin again. And, and you know, it's, it's important to me to know that when I fail and when I falter and when I'm wrong, that I can be forgiven. Turn over the New Testament to John chapter 3, where Jesus is talking actually about what God has done through him or what God is going to do through him. He says in chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world, that He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. We don't have to perish because of our sin, but we can have eternal life. Listen to verse 17, which actually in some ways is more powerful than 16. When it says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through Him. Hence Paul could write, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, you see. Because the purpose of Jesus coming into the world at that particular time was not to condemn, but to bring about salvation. wonder how well he did. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 7. Begin reading with verse 44. <clears throat> I wonder how well Jesus did in relationship to this condemnation thing and, and offering forgiveness, see? Luke chapter 7, verse 44. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and she wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who has been forgiven little loves little. And then Jesus turned to the woman and said, Woman, your sins are forgiven. Now the other guests begin to say among themselves, Who is this that even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What a beautiful situation here. Where Jesus is in the midst of some people who are obviously people who are endeavoring to be righteous. 
And into their midst come this lady who might not have a lifestyle which is quite so honorable. And yet Jesus said not only her sin, but he said what? Her many sins are forgiven. He didn't just take care of one or two problems that this lady might have, but he set her completely free. And he said, you can go, your faith has saved you. Go in peace, you're all right. Boy, forgiveness is a powerful thing when it's used. It's also a powerful thing when it's withheld. It's a powerful, beautiful, wonderful tool when it's used, but it is a tool of destruction when it's withheld. Jesus was one that just, just was willing to forgive. I think the climax for me in the life of Jesus is in the 23rd chapter of the book of Luke. And, and verse 34, where Jesus is hanging there on the cross. Looking down at the feet of the cross, at the foot of the cross there, where, where they were even casting lots for his garments. And he looked down at the men who had nailed him to the cross, and then he looked to his father, and he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Now you see, it's my humble opinion that if the Lord Jesus Christ could forgive the very men that nailed him to the cross, that he'll take care of me too. And that he'll forgive me too. So when I look to God and the Lord Jesus Christ to try to find out what they will do for me or toward me in this matter of sin and forgiveness, I find out that it's 100% complete. The only question at all as to whether God will forgive is the question of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Everything else as far as we can find in the Word of God is forgivable and I'm grateful for that. I'm thankful that I can stand before you this morning and tell you that He can and He will forgive. No question about it. So then I begin to turn to other people. And I begin to consider what I could expect from you when I sin. And I search the scripture. And, and I begin to wonder, you know, if I sin against other people, what will they do? And you know what I found your obligation to me to be? I didn't find anything in there. I found out I could ask you. I found out that I could expect you to forgive me. But I didn't find anywhere in there that, that I could count on it or demand that you forgive me. Just didn't in there. Blew the whole second point of my sermon. There wasn't any writings in the Bible. <laughs> you, know, you know about that. I could expect it, but I, I couldn't demand it anywhere. There was nowhere. In the Bible that would, would allow me to demand that you forgive me. It said I could ask. So I went on and added a little more to the third point. Seems that we had that, that much time left over. See, there was no second point. The one that I really wanted to know about, but I wasn't quite as willing to study as intently about, was what I'm supposed to do for you. See, that's the one that really matters, isn't it? How am I supposed to react to you when you sin against me? What are we supposed to do in relationship to others? Now, we're not the only ones that wonder about that. Peter wondered about it, didn't he, in Matthew, the 18th chapter? <clears throat> Matthew 18, verse 21, Then Peter came to Jesus, and he asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? How about seven times? Now I'm sure that Peter was, was expecting the Lord to put his arms around him and clap him on the back and say, Man, you've gone out of your way seven times. Wow! But that wasn't the Lord's response, was it? 
Some versions say, how about 77 times? Others say, how about 7 times 70? The Lord said, I tell you that you just forgive that much. And what he was saying when he put those kind of numbers on there was he saying you just forgive until it becomes a way of life. He wasn't telling you to count up to 490. He was saying that you just forgive and forgive and forgive until it becomes second nature to you to forgive. Because then he launched into that teaching about the unmerciful servant in order to back up his statement to Peter. So he says, therefore, king, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began to settle, the settlement, a man owed him 10,000 talents, was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. And the servant fell on his knees before him and said, Be patient with me. I'll pay you back everything. And the servant's master took pity on him and canceled all the debt and let him go. He didn't say, I will let you go until you pay it all back. He canceled it all. And he just let the man go totally free. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he grabbed him and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay you back. Sounds familiar? But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay all of his debts. Now, when the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and told their master everything had happened. The master called the servant back in. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all of the debt of yours because you begged me to do so. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he had owed. And we all agree with that, don't we? That that is justice and fair. When all of this major debt had been canceled and he refused to do likewise for a small debt that was in his favor, he got what was coming to him. And then Jesus said, This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you Unless you forgive your brother from your heart. That's a pretty powerful statement. You see, we love to read in the Word of God. Where God will forgive every trespass that we do against Him. On the other hand, we love to judge and condemn other people for the things that they do against us. The truth of the matter is that sometimes we get so caught up in condemnation and judgment that we even love to judge and condemn other people that have no effect on us. We still like that. They don't have anything to do and they've done nothing against us. But just because of the way they are, we like to condemn them. And we can read scripture that does condemn them. But we shouldn't be involved in that, you see. Because the mission of the church is to seek and save the lost, not to pronounce judgment and condemnation. And if God can forgive everything from every man, then can't we do likewise? Now the minute we dig in to get serious about forgiveness of all sin to all people, Then somebody wants to rear up and said, but Brother Ed, how far ought we go on this matter? 
Well, it'd be pretty easy for me to just simply say, you go as far as you'd want God to go with you. But then you see, if you're not involved in that particular sin that you want to judge and be critical and condemning of, well, then you can excuse yourself with that, say. A lot of people say, Ed, but if you, if you just do all that forgiving and, and, and you, you just let people off the hook and, and you water down the teachings of Jesus. Because Jesus said, don't do those things. No, I don't water down the teachings. Some of the teachings of Jesus are different to different people and, and we want to lump them all together. Let's look at a couple of issues that are major with us, okay? I, I don't like just flirting around the idea and talk about sin in general and, and, and offenses in general, things like that. Let, let's get down to a couple of things that are real and they're in the Scriptures examples for us. How about the thing of adultery? You know, this thing of adultery is a major thing in the church. It probably used to be more major than it is today, but it's, it's a pretty major thing. That, boy, that's, that's kind of one of the unforgivables. Well, what is the teaching of the Scripture on adultery? Well, in Matthew, Jesus said when he was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, verse 5, or chapter 5, verse 27, 28, he made it very plain. He said, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone that looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, you see, that makes every man a liar, or I mean a, a, a sinner. He's either an adulterer or a liar, for the most part. Now, some may be pure of that, but most of us aren't. And so he says, you see, to these people, don't commit adultery. God does not like it. It is not something. It is so much so that I don't like it. I don't even like you thinking about it. Now, suppose I catch somebody in adultery and I forgive them. Have I watered down this teaching? No. Look at John. Look at John chapter 8. The first 11 verses. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts. Where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought him in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus. Teacher this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They were accusing, or they were using this question to trap in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus. But Jesus bent down, started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And those who heard began to go away, one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with a woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. See, one of the things, if we're going to put together the teachings on forgiveness and the teachings of Jesus that said don't do certain things, we are going to have to come to the understanding that the teaching in Matthew 5 that said don't commit adultery was made to those who have not committed adultery. Don't do it. God doesn't like it. Don't even think about it. And then the teaching in John 8 is made to a different person. It's made to an individual who was already taken by the sin. 
And that teaching is you can be forgiven. And notice he didn't change. He told her not to do it again. Told her not to do it again. You see. So gang, one of the things we've got to know is that when we forgive people and let them off of the hook, so to speak, for the judgment and the condemnation and the the penance and all of that thing that goes along with the sin, we are not watering down the teachings of God. We are making the teaching that belongs to the person that we're facing. And too many times we want to make the teaching on adultery and things like this that should be made to those who've never done it, we want to make that teaching to those that are involved in it. And while we're making a teaching of God, we're making it to the wrong individual. So gang, when you forgive somebody of a sin, you don't let them off the hook. If there's any social condemnation, they're still going to feel it. And if God still wants to condemn them, He'll do it. You're not changing that any. You're just creating a situation where they can have new life and and no responsibility to you in terms of condemnation, you see. And you're doing what Jesus would have done. Another biggie among us is divorce. It's time that we in the church learn how to deal with the divorce issue. Or else print in the divorce decree that you are now bound for hell forever. Because it's here, it's among us. We have family members. There are some people here in this audience that have been divorced. What does Jesus actually say? Well, go back to Matthew 5 again. Hey, there's no question. Matthew 5, verse 30 and 30, or 31, 32. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone that divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. No question about the fact that God doesn't like divorce and that it's a sin. None whatsoever. Yet you go look at the whole chapter of John 4. You know what that's about, don't you? You Remember the old gal at the well? What did Jesus tell her? He said, you're right, lady, you ain't got no husband. But then he said, you've had five. And the guy you're there, the guy you're living with today, you're not even married to. Then what do you do with that lady? Now I want to admit to you that there is nowhere in here where it says I forgive you. Okay? But I want to read verse 39. Many of the Samaritans. From that town believed in him because of this woman's testimony. He told me everything I did. Now do you think that they would have believed in Jesus because he told her everything that she did and that she was an awful and wicked woman and hadn't even ought to be a part of society? Or do you think maybe they believed in the testimony because he told me that I was such a wicked sinner, but that I could be forgiven, you see? That village invited Jesus to stay. I'd like to suggest to you that he he forgave the lady. And the teaching on divorce is two. One, if you haven't, don't. If at all possible, don't. But gang, if you have, you can 
still be whole and complete and forgiven. The issue so many times on these sins is not did you sin and are you required to pay penance, but does forgiveness make you white and pure and clean and whole again? And I believe that it does. I believe you're free from the sin that you've done in the past if you've been forgiven. I was preaching this message down a little further in Southern Illinois a few years ago. I had an 82-year-old lady come out of the church and just hugged me and cried. She finally gained her composure and she said, Preacher, I said, I'm 82 years old. I've been faithful to the church since I was small. But said in my early 20s, I had a bad marriage. And I got a divorce. And I've taught Sunday school in this church for over 60 years. And I've always felt like a second class Christian. And for the first time in my life this morning, I feel like I'm all right with Jesus. My friends, forgiveness is perpetuating. The lack of forgiveness is perpetuating sin. Does forgiveness make a man whole and free or not? We'd better learn the teachings on some of these sins like adultery and divorce. Because the truth of the matter is, sometimes the stand of the church made to the wrong people is causing those people to stay outside of the kingdom. Or at least if they endeavor to come inside, they're not comfortable. And they feel like second-class Christians. We've got to deal with that. Why is it that a murderer could repent and change? Or a drug addict can come out of the drug situation and we make a hero out of them. Or a drunk can completely quit alcohol and transform his life and he becomes a highly respected member of the church. But if you've been caught in adultery or you've got a divorce, you're still just a little tainted. I, I don't know. You know one that's just tearing me up today is abortion. There's no question where the kingdom of God stands on abortion. Absolutely none. And yet I find the public display of attitude from the church is one of hatred and anger and condemnation rather than one of love and forgiveness and understanding. Oh, how I wish that we could get to the point where we understand that the teaching on abortion is like that on murder and some others don't do it. But oh how I wish that we learned to set those little girls who've been involved in this free of the guilt. Not by condoning the action but by putting the loving arms of Jesus Christ around them until they understand that even though they did, they're all right if, they, if they'll just turn to Him. And you see, it takes a miraculous confrontation of the Holy Spirit sometimes to get people to understand that they're all right because the church doesn't let them know. And I don't understand why we picked and chosen. But we have, haven't we? 
I don't condone the acts that we've been talking about. But boy, I condone forgiveness. I, I, I think that's what ought to reign. You see, that's the thing that the world needs to know. Now, I, I want forgiveness for two reasons. One, I want people to know that they can be forgiven. That's important because they failed. But if there can possibly be a reason that is more important than that, listen to this from the lips of Jesus. And, and Matthew, the sixth chapter, he's still in that Sermon on the Mount where he's dealing with things like adultery and, and, and divorce and stuff like that. And he's teaching the fellows how to pray. Do you remember that? Our Father in heaven. And he goes all through that prayer. And then when he concluded that prayer in, in chapter 13 or verse 13 where he says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Then he re-emphasizes one of the main points of the, of the prayer. In verse 14 and 15, listen to it. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, then your Father will not forgive you your sins. You see, when he re-emphasized the main points of the prayer, he did not re-emphasize the hallowedness of the Father in heaven. He did not re-emphasize your kingdom come, your will be done. He did not re-emphasize the daily bread thing. He re-emphasized the forgiveness issue. Because he wanted you to know that if you do, he will. And if you don't, he won't. Listen, it's not just a matter of those that are living in sin, understanding that they can be forgiven of it and be pure and white and holy. But listen, there are a lot of people in the church today who have been washed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that are once again standing in danger of the judgment because of an unforgiving spirit. Luke recorded this same statement this way. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. All my friends, I'm concerned about those who are trapped in sin. And I want them to know that forgiveness is a good way out of it. I want them to know that, that they can be pure and holy and okay. Not only in God's eyes, but I want them to know that they can be all right in our eyes. But I want us to know also that an unforgiving spirit puts us right back in danger of the judgment because Jesus said, if you do, he will. But if you don't, he won't. We make it so hard. But there is nothing that any member of your family has done to you that can't be forgiven. There is nothing that any person in your sphere of work has done to you that cannot be forgiven. 